you know, when we talk about customer obsession, it's about from a sales point of view, not viewing, you know, people in terms of customers or prospects entirely. It's really about partnership and seeing, you know, our market, seeing our addressable market really as a community. And when we view them as a community, our approach shifts. So we're not just seeing them as targets, prospects, suspects that we're going after to try to bring them into the funnel, to try to, you know, twist their arms, to buy our software, to hound them and really get them to, you know, sort of give in and just see us as being the best by being in their faces 24 seven. We're stopping, we're taking a step back. And what we're saying is the people who are in these roles, there are people. That's how we talk about them internally. We say our people, what will our, our people think about this? And so when we start viewing them in that way, we start viewing them as people who we have to partner with. I'm Devin Reed. And I'm Sheena Badani. And you're watching Reveal, the revenue intelligence podcast powered by Gong. Keep watching here to see the full interview. Or if you like to listen to podcasts on the go, check out the links in the description below. And if you like what you hear, subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, or all of them. Why not? And while you're there, make sure to leave us a five-star review. We personally read every single one, and I think I speak for both of us when I say they mean the world to us. Could not agree more, Devin. Now, without further ado, here's the episode you've been waiting for. Joseph, thank you for joining me and hanging out. It's got to be kind of late in Tel Aviv at this point in the day. It's a little late. I won't hold it too much against you. Uh, Just a little after 8 p.m. here. All right. Well, I appreciate you making time for Reveal and our audience. Uh, And I'm excited for the topic, customer centricity as a competitive advantage. We'll see how many times I say customer centricity today and how many times I stumble over it because a good hyphenated word is known to get me sometimes. But let's get into it. So Base AI, formerly Crowdvocate, has experienced impressive growth over the last three years. Can you tell us a little bit about that growth that you've experienced and maybe what you attribute it to? Yeah, totally. I mean, so at our core, what we are for people who aren't familiar is we're a customer marketing platform. And what we do is we centralize and automate, you know, customer marketing advocacy and reference programs to really support rapid expansion and scalability. So practically, you know, what that really means is, is that we have a software, we have a set of solutions that's designed around helping give maximum value to your install base while also extracting maximum value for your from your install base to the top of the funnel so in terms of what our growth is really all about i think number one it's all about having a mission and a vision i think our ceo gal biran has come up with a really expansive mission for the business and a very very broad kind of roadmap in terms of where he sees things going and that mission is really centered around and i'm going to give you an easier abbreviation to use than customer centric Um, is all about what we call customer-led growth, so CLG, right? Mm -hmm. Which is all about acknowledging that if the install base is the company's most valuable asset, then tools that engage and really add value and encourage advocacy and references are included in that. It really encourage people to help create content, promote your brand in ways that influence the top of the funnel. This is really one of the most strategic things that you can do to grow and solidify our business. And I think we're sitting and acknowledging this. We acknowledge this as a company at our core. And really, our mission is to take the people who sit within those customer marketing type roles, like references, like advocacy and others, and really help empower them to become you know, the most strategic arm of you know, marketing. And for us, I think that's that catching on to that, you know, that mission and that vision, like a movement internally is what's really guiding people forward. And there's almost nothing better when you're sitting in this like really interesting, vibrant growing startup. You know, I hope everybody who's in sales has the opportunity to feel that. And you feel like you're a part of moving something forward. And I think that's got really everybody, you know, giving, you know, 100% all the time and really loving it. I know I've been here for four months, five months full time. I was a consultant for two years before then. I don't feel like I've worked one day. And trust me, if you ask my wife, I'm definitely working. So just being in a position where I can be in that flow state, I think it's been contagious for us. Love flow state. Any, anything I can do to get closer to it, I'm about it. Um, okay, so I'm interested. So my question was, I was going to make I ask you, I said make you by accident. I was going to ask you to define customer centricity because to me, my right. mind was like, is that the same as customer obsessed? And, you know, right. with, with all, you know, not, not to, you know, 
be negative. It kind of could be a buzz, a bit of a buzz phrase. Sure. But I did a little bit of research on you and I saw on your banner on LinkedIn, uh, community led growth, CLG. I'd never seen that before. Is that some, is that the same thing or how is it different? And is that something that you and, uh, and base AI came up with? Yeah. So it's really for us customer led growth, but it, it, it's the same concept. Um, you're right. It can be a buzzword, like so much of what we do in the sales industry and tech. But for us, what customer led growth really means is first, it's a practical definition. It means that we help use your install base to feed the top of your funnel. So literally, when we talk about customer led growth and customer centricity, we're talking about an approach tactically, strategically, which is about using essentially, you know, forgive the term, that asset of your install base, mm -hmm. not just to sit there and wait to be sold to in this sort of perpetual sales cycle, but to add value to them in ways that we do, for example, through our tools and solutions, I'm not going to go into it in detail, and then encourage them to also reshare, you know, advocacy content videos with other people that are that are really going to help them actually use that solution better mm -hmm. and optimize their business. It's really about that that approach to it, and then taking that information and allowing it to influence the top of the funnel. This is this is what I think real customer centricity is about practically, from that pragmatic point of view getting that install base to influence the top of the funnel. I mean, that's that's the most pragmatic thing you can do in terms of being customer centric. There's a business culture component too. And I think that, you know, when we talk about customer obsession and we, you know, we have an event coming up called Obsession Soon. Um, so we're really using all the terms surrounding the customer in that way. It's, it's about, from a sales point of view, not viewing, you know, people in terms of, customers or prospects entirely hmm. it's really about partnership and seeing you know our market seeing our addressable market really as a community and when we view them as a community our approach shifts so we're not just seeing them as targets prospects suspects that we're going after to try to bring them into the funnel to try to you know twist their arms to buy our software to hound them and really get them to you know, sort of give in and just see us as being the best by being in their faces 24 seven, we're stopping, we're taking a step back. And what we're saying is the people who are in these roles, they're our people. That's how we talk about them internally. We say our people, what will our, our people think about this? And someone who was a new employee said, you keep saying our people, like they didn't know what that meant. And I was like, yeah. no, I'm talking to, to our customers, to our install base to our market, the whole overall vibrant community of people who this business literally exists to support. And so when we start viewing them in that way, we start viewing them as people who we have to partner with. And partnering is all about being consultative. And I think a lot of the consultative piece that we have, we're very lucky. Our CEO, Gabiran, he was essentially, you know, a marketing consultant for many years before forming this business and working in other large companies. But his approach as a consultant is really, really well refined. And when he's when he was in the sales process with prospects, explaining to them, you know, the advantages of the tool, he's not just helping them understand, you know, how this tool is great, how it's wonderful. He's right. giving them a vision for how they can execute their jobs in a massive way. And so what we found there was is that he's really someone who can not only amplify, you know, this the problem and the solution really in an effective way for the customer, but he's someone who adds real value because he's giving advice and being very casual as he talks through it in a way that people can digest. So that philosophy of being ready 24 seven, of being prepared to accept all people who come our way as our people who we need to help. And of course, you know, our aim is to help them as a business, right? But to help them achieve what they need to do, that's right. really at the core, I think for us of being customer centric and the culture we're trying to build here. So. You've got that practical definition, right? Use the install base for top of the funnel. You've got the philosophical cultural definition, which is view them literally as a community. And we have a few ways that we try to operationalize that thinking. I like that a lot. Uh, target audience never felt quite right, even though it's, you know, it, it, it gives the meaning and context when you're, you know, when you're talking to somebody, so you know, but yeah, calling a person a target, uh, I think you said suspect, which was new to me, but uh, also probably yeah, the most- that, That's even older. That's an even older term I'm pulling out for you. But yeah, yeah that's, that's like even more indicative of kind of viewing people in this kind of objectified way instead of viewing them as people who need help. Right. 
Right. I'm a big proponent of the words and phrasing that you use every day, especially internally. They're going to either reflect or change how, you know, the meaning of what you're trying to say. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of times it kind of bleeds externally of like, yeah, if you call someone prospect, prospect, target audience, target audience, you're going to start viewing them as a thing and less of a person, uh, which obviously is kind of a, a cornerstone of, of, your, of your vision. I'll give you an example. Um, we had a conference we came back recently, one of the first, you know, in person in a while for us. And, you know, we have the list of leads, right? The leads, where are the leads? And, you know, we stopped, you know, I spoke with my team who are people who, uh, you know, we've recruited because they understand this language so well. And it's hang on a second. These aren't simply leads. These are people who came to our booth and have a business problem. We did take notes. We understand that they have this problem. Let's discuss the problem first. So let's think about our partners and our people and what it is they actually needed. And then we can talk about the leads, that kind of transactional aspect. And it made a big difference. I think everybody sat down afterwards. We, for everyone who had notes from the show, we didn't forget them and leave them in a notebook. We pulled them out. We added them into the Excel to understand exactly what the issues were. We sort of talked through how we would prepare you know, to address the challenges we think that they could have. And we started seeing, you know, very quick, you know, responses to emails because it was easier to customize or personalize an email when you would customize the thought process for approaching that person. Absolutely. Well, I like it too, is you're doing some of the kind of uh, the unscalable things like taking handwritten notes, putting them into a cell doc, actually looking at them, like not, not just a drop down of three problems. You know what I mean? And there's nothing wrong with that, but you know what I mean? Like adding that additional layer sure. of context per person and, and just reminding folks, Hey, yeah, these are humans. They made a decision to come to our booth and invest time with us. Let's reciprocate sure. that. Let's make it worth their time with the way we interact with them afterwards. Yeah, it, it, part of that is also acknowledging that, you know, guys, we can either be here and sell to people all day, or we can be people who help these people become successful in their careers and their businesses successful. Yeah. So we can either deliver success, right? Or we can focus on actually transacting with people. What do you think is more valuable? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the conversation. Right? What do you think makes more sense? What's the approach that works right for you? And so basically in order to really kind of make sure that that approach is inculcated in the team. You know, we make a significant component of our compensation based on, you know, like an MBO, like those behaviors to make it that, you know, this is really important. It is significant. And yeah. if we see you going above and beyond in a few key areas, then, you know, we're going to reward you in that way too, because that's really helping build, you know, the mission and the brand. Absolutely. Well, I'm curious, Joseph, what are some of the, reactions of your, um, oh, hold on, I almost said prospects and clients, so you're already teaching me, uh, of your people when you have this approach to them, right? I have to imagine they're verbalizing this in some positive ways. Like what are some of those things that they're saying? And, and maybe it's a direct, you know, compliment, but maybe it's, you know, a little deeper of like, hey, no other, I'm gonna use vendor, forgive me, you know, just to use that vernacular, but no other vendor is treating us this way or having this like type of relationship. I'm curious, what is that kind of market feedback that you're hearing? I mean, I think the market feedback we kind of touched up front. It's about the fast growth that we've gone through. I can't go into the details on those numbers, but that really is the result for us. You know, we sit in a space. First of all, the people who, you know, we engage with in our community are people who we are interested in doing business with are some of the most, you know, kind, authentic people who I've ever worked with in business. They're people who are in marketing frequently and who are customer focused. That's a very, very unique person within the whole go-to market. It's someone who really cares about not only making the customer successful, but about making other people internally successful, making the customer's business successful, and partnering with them too. So um, I think we've created a lot of great bonds uh, with our community, with our people. And the result is, is you know, the revenue and the growth that we've been seeing so far in the last year and a half. And the fact that, you know, we have, you know, more people coming in you know, to, you know, learn about what we do and learn about our approach then at the moment we can definitely handle, which is like a great experience. And the fact that, you know, we're, we're able to really engage people in a really, I think, profound way. It's, you know, we're able to, as a result of this, you know, it's, we're able to help people with their requirements documentation. I have AEs who will spend a substantial period of time working on defining of requirements. This is one of the later funnel kind of metrics that I tick off to be able to track to start measuring and figure out, you know, how scalable is that? How much will it help? And that can be time consuming. That's right. why we save it for 
a specific time in our choreography. And one of the other things that I'm tracking too there is, you know, how much individual personalization are you using in your presentation or demo? And so I, this is this is for Gong too, the ability to like search and view based off of slides that are used. I'm literally able to use that to identify slides that they're using and creating themselves that are targeted towards this person. It's not just altering a little bit of text, it's creating you know, a couple different slides and, an, and creating an impression and experience for them that's different from the last person we sold to. So I think that's that, that's a piece too that we find a lot of success with. And I like giving, you know, AEs the ability to be creative when they have creativity. And, you know, when we have the right people lined up with that creativity and with that connection with people, the results show, you know, what they are in terms of the fast growth of customers that we've had today. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I like that a lot. And I'm uh, going back to saying, hey, you know, some of the stuff you're doing is not scalable, right? And and that's kind of part of it. And if you, if you think about it, you know, like personalization at scale, it doesn't really exist in my book because it's kind of like, how do you have, how do you have a thousand true friendships at once, uh, you, you know, that are all the same, right. right? You can't. That's the kind of the whole point. Sure. So I guess where I'm going with this is, you know, how do you balance the kind of like resources, right? Of like knowing, hey, we need to have scalable, predictable revenue, but at the same time, we're going to do unscalable, maybe unpredictable things to kind of get there. So maybe you can kind of help reconcile that a little bit of maybe how you view balancing some of those different things. So when it comes to balancing, you know, the scalable with the unscalable, it's, it's context is key, right? So there's two or three things that we do to help us balance that. Number one, We've got, you know, a really nice amount of inbound lead flow that makes spending time on personalization of things like presentations a lot easier Two, out of with the items that aren't coming in inbound. We have a really detailed and really highly curated target account list that we work on for each AE. And we also have, you know, an outbound approach inherent within our culture. And so once we're able to focus, you know, the personalization on inbound for the presentation and the personalization on the outbound for the target account list then that really creates, you know, a, a very balanced context for where we're using that personalization. Like you mentioned, you can't personalize every email. You know, we do distinguish between personalization and relevance. Right. And over years and years and years of testing personalization and relevance, and again, I, I don't really have a, a clear kind of distinction for you, but I think every AE who's out there knows that every BDR out there knows the difference between you know, what it takes to do a highly personalized email that you spend an hour on preparing versus creating a pretty well kind of tailored template that feels conversational and geared towards maybe a particular industry or role or title. Right. And, you know, basically just changing, you know, the person who it's going towards relevance, relevant information. That's much more scalable. So we do we do try to push on that. And it's a learning process, too, at the moment. I think because, you know, we are, you know, we're fast growing business, but we're still a relatively small team. We're around 45 people today. You know, in that type of environment, you know, we want to grow quickly and growing quickly for us means really connecting with our customers early on. So in a way, yes, for a hundred person sales team to be doing that might not be as scalable for a smaller team like we are today with, I think, the unique approach that we take for us. I think it's helping us create traction. There, there's definitely opportunities that we miss for sure. And there's times when we have to stop and say, OK, maybe we need to pull it back a little bit on the amount of time and attention we're paying on a particular opportunity because we're not quite there. There are, you know, the people we're working with there who we want to partner with and make, you know, our customers. These are people who, you know, they're not yet ready for it and we're not forcing it. We want to wait for them to come to us. You need to be in a position where you've got, you know, the pipeline to be able to do that, of course. Right. But, you know, I, I try to say, you know, I was laughed at the other day, uh, but I try to say it's like love. Sometimes you've got to let it go and it will come back and be yours, right? If it does. So that's, there's a little bit of that balance in there. Well, well that analogy fits the, our people, right? Cause you really believe they're people Lo love, uh, you know, love, love. You can't put a timeline on that and, uh, you can only do your, you only do your best. Um, but going, kind of going back to what you said, which I really liked about the relevance versus personalization. The way I've kind of viewed it, having been that AE writing, writing a, you know, a very personalized email is like to me, true personalization is if I'm writing to Joseph, this email only makes sense to Joseph. If yes. I send it to I think Jane, I think that's a good way of defining it. She's like, what is this? This doesn't, I mean, you know, she's going to understand it, but it's not going to be uh, relevant to her. Relevance is like, well, I can send it to all you know, I don't know, VPs of sales, because I know they have these core three problems and it will be relevant to Joseph, but it will be relevant to 
Jane VP sales, Joe VP sales, et cetera. So that's kind of how I view it for, for folks listening in case they're uh, kind of wondering how to, how to make it a little more scalable. Yeah, definitely. I, I typically, you know, the way I refer to it is that, you know, relevance is about the person and sorry, uh, personalization is about, of course, the person, but relevance is about the function, the role, the company. That's what those things tend to focus on. Yep, absolutely. Well, yeah, and I imagine you're saying too, you know, we have a lot of inbound and, uh, you know, it kind of enables you to have a little bit of freedom when you have that pipeline. I have to imagine, because you said something earlier, which is interesting, which was like, where sh- people are coming to us to learn about our approach. That's mm-hmm. different. That's a mindset. That's a, you know, a new way of operating, which is going to pull people towards you, not a new tool to do something that they already know exists. Right, like a better, faster way to do something, and you know what I mean. It could be both. I don't obviously know the tool. Uh, I haven't used it. Myself. No, totally. But yeah. you know, there's a difference between like, oh, we have this thing, and we need a better version. Versus, wait, what is Base AI doing? Because like, I'm hearing this thing about customer led growth, and I want to go learn more about it because it sounds like there's a better way to operate. Totally. Um, so the the approach for us is, you know, is, is highly, of course, you know, software driven, you know, a lot of the people that we work with just from a practical point of view, whether they're, you know, reference managers who are managing their entire reference program inside of Google Sheets mm-hmm. for potentially dozens, you know, of references for hundreds, sometimes even more uh, prospects and, you know, customers that they're working with. They just have this really non-scalable way of doing things. They know this. This is what they tell mm-hmm. us. And, you know, our approach from, you know, our software point of view, helping automate and scale this piece. So they're spending their time, you know, on actually executing on what we think of as that customer marketing or reference management piece, mm-hmm. you know, 80% of the time versus doing admin 80% of the right. time. That's that, that's a part of the approach. I think the other side of it, too, is, is that we've expressed a lot of thought leadership online, right. even as a small business over the last few years. I think because, you know, our CEO, Gal, has really, really understood and, you know, he's really come to live these principles that we've talked about and really come to understand the gaps in right. the products that, you know, a lot of our people have. And then, you know, he's really thought this through as well as our product team. And we've learned a lot from the field. And, you know, I think this has allowed people to, you know, say, hey, this is a company that gets it. And then now let's see also the technology. Right. And, and that's that's what I meant uh, earlier. If it, if it wasn't clear, is like that painting a problem. And then, by the way, we have the solution to solve it versus I think a lot of marketing is like, hey, here's this technology. Here's the solution. Here's the solution. But it's kind of like, again, you have to win that faster, better, right. smarter race. And that's not really the, you know, and the, and the ever growing competitive oh. landscape. But that, that's a that's a tough battle. Okay, so I'm 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 all in. Like I said, you had me at customer led growth on the LinkedIn profile because I was like, huh, something's happening over there. I'm curious, Joseph, other ways that you measure this in terms of is it working? You had mentioned something. Uh, forgive me, I forgive the exact name, but like an AE was doing something late in the sales cycle, and that's something you're measuring. Are there any other like air quoting metrics? Because it's almost kind of like activities or you know what i mean or stages maybe the metric you know what i mean are there other things that you're measuring to say like hey this is specifically how we operate as a customer-led growth company or what else are you looking at yeah so some of it is is basic uh the thing that you were referencing before is you know the requirements we've built out kind of this rfp requirements document that you know a lot of our people come to us and they you know they need to you know maneuver internally if they want to buy something like this and so a huge portion of what we do is help them understand you know how to buy this internally what they're going to need to do so a large amount of our effort is dedicated to that and i think that's a unique portion of being you know customer kind of centric in that context right. where it's not, a lot of sales is you know it's not about you know the the value proposition and you know, showing the value to people and helping them understand the value of the solution or being consultative. It's being a guide to people and helping them understand how to do this internally. You know, there, you know, the, the space for customer marketing solutions and, you know, reference management or advocacy programs, it's not a massive space. And not everyone who are in the, who's in those roles today has a lot of experience actually buying solutions. So a big part of what we do is, you know, we want to give them the confidence of understanding you know, how to take, how to build the business case internally, what they need to show people, what they need to show a CFO and a procurement team in order to get moving. And that's an area we, we spend a lot of time on because we can tell when someone feels really comfortable with being able to buy a solution internally, they, they know the process. Right. And when they don't, 
we don't sit back and say, oh, they don't know how to buy. Well, too bad for us. It's just the opposite. We see that as a massive opportunity. So one of the things I look at is for, you know, our later stage pipeline, you know, in how many of these deals and how many of these opportunities actually have you actually helped come up with requirements and build out the business case for them? And, and we have a, a tool that we've built internally that we use for that. But how many of those, how many have, have had that? Right. And we look at the metrics on those and we know that there's, those are going to close at a certain point by over 85%, uh, by over an 85% rate. Right. So we know how important it is to have that. Could be other factors too. You know, we're still young, we're learning a lot. But that to me is a big one for the late stage. For the earlier stage pipeline, uh, it's all about for the earliest stage, really, for like that demo stage post discovery. It's about how much personalization are you putting into that presentation? I want a slide. I want you to come up with a slide. I want to see, you know, what you've put in there based off the discovery that is going to speak directly to what it is you think they need. Where do you think the gaps are in their understanding about how to approach this? Whether it's understanding, you know, how to manage it, how to deploy it. Um, and then finally, I think the, the simplest one is upfront. When we talk about those target accounts per rep that we have, we have a very fixed amount of them. And, you know, I, I do expect that on each one of those accounts and we have a weekly session where we review it, we're small enough where we can do that. You know, I want to get a sense of not just why this is a fit that I usually understand pretty much immediately because of how we curate the list, but I want to understand what the business logic mm -hmm. someone's going to be leading into that account is if they're going after it outbound. So those are pretty much three ways I'm tracking it. All right, Joseph, I imagine that our listeners are excited. They're bought in. They see the vision. They know what to measure. But how do we get started is might be the question. So maybe let's start with this. How do early stage startups faced with limited resources get customer centricity right from the beginning? Right. Well, obviously, uh, they buy base AI. But after that, <laughs> um, after that's done, um, I think first and foremost, uh, you know, this is a principle that I feel pretty strongly about in terms of sales management that I think works in this area pretty neatly. And we're talking specifically from the sales, you know, the commercial side of the business, the go-to market. The first thing is that sales can, in, even in startups, and especially maybe in startups, sales can become an isolated function to an extent where... It might very early on be a business that's created by, you know, people who don't necessarily understand or know sales. You know, the salesperson gets hired and the expectation is kind of like sales is magic. Go sell, make the selling happen. And the challenge of that is, is that it's a very isolating approach. And it sort of says sales will create its success by itself. And to me, that's not the case. To me, it, it does, to borrow a term, take a village to really, really get sales done, to get customers on board, to be able to deliver value. Um, and for us, it's all about everybody having leading and lagging indicators directly connected to revenue. Um, I don't wanna be in a world where someone thinks, well, that's a sales job, we've given them MQLs, let's argue over the definition of an SQL. Right. I, I just don't have the time or the patience for that type of thing, and I don't think our, our, you know, our people do either. They want us operating in a really efficient way with them to help them get what they need, whether it's, you know, creating content, you know, and, and value added webinars and podcasts to that that are going to help them do their job much right. better. Or it's just being, you know, to the point when they want something. So I think that's the first thing about being customer centric as a business. We aren't product, marketing, sales, CS, all separate. No, we're all connected to the overall revenue. And each of us have a different, you know, function within that broader scope. And keeping that connected is really, really important early on because I've seen it, you know, kill more than a few startups to have all of the operations very siloed and very separated. So that to me is a really big piece of it. Um, and I think that's important knowledge for any sales team. I think another kind of practical takeaway there is, is in an early stage startup, especially everyone is responsible for the playbook and everyone needs to understand, you know, we're all here to not just help grow this business and this venture and this mission, but we're also building for the next right. stage. Like that's really important as a leader. And when you start off in a startup, you understand, you know, there's, there's different levels of leaders, different levels of teams and different phases of the way this company will mm -hmm. grow. That has to be obvious. And if that is obvious, then you need to make sure that everybody at the start is creating the playbook. You don't want to, you don't want to just, you know, rely on one person's playbook and structure because more often than not, that person is just going to take 
you know, what they did at the last company to this new one and the type of market that we're in with, you know, the unique audience that we work with and the value we want to deliver, that's not scalable. That won't track and won't work. So we need to make sure that everybody, whether it's, you know, people who are in marketing or in CS or in sales, they're all contributing towards what the sales playbook will look like long-term from the CS side of, what handovers, successful handovers look like, that's everyone, but how does it work for, you know, a customer led growth business? When it comes to marketing, it's, you know, how do we get the, you know, right types of people in the hands of sales to speak with? How do we make sure that, you know, these are our people up front? How do we do that? Because we know that our people, when it's people who are, you know, that right type of fit for us, they're going to convert much better than people who are kind of like on the borderline who maybe don't need what we have quite as much. And we don't want to force people and twist their arms into, you know, convincing them why this is valuable. I want to get to the people who need this right up front. So that's an important piece there. And and with my own team, it's what did we learn this week? You know, we, we, we have a remote team at the moment. You know, we have a touch point every single day. What did we learn this week? Let's go through the top calls. What did we pull out? Was there a piece of personalization we used that really stood out and created a wow factor? Was there a wow factor? Was there not? I use wow factor as a filter on gong, the word wow, wherever it appears, I get an alert on that. Someone said, wow, from the other side, boom, into the investor's deck on the wow factor. So it's, that's an important metric for me. And that's, that's, I think how we are, how we're approaching. I think how most people can approach it. That's fantastic. And and I like that a lot. And, uh, you know, we we don't talk about gong, the product, uh, on purpose on the show for that reason. But, uh, yeah, I do the same thing when someone's like, you know, want to go find a moment, go type in wow into gong and pay the customers and, or the audience, you know, the market and you'll, you'll get, you'll get real, real market feedback very quickly. Well, we started with, you know, small startups. And so now I'm curious, like which, which is harder, Joseph, in your experience, you know, being a, being customer centric as a large enterprise organization or as a startup, I have to imagine there's kind of, I'll say pros and cons, but really, you know, things that are easier versus harder for both. That's, I think a really good question. Um, so in, in the early startup, I think, you know, the ability to have this kind of well-oiled closely knit team aligned with a specific mission and vision, very motivated by that as a driver is huge. Obviously, if you can capture that, um, you know, as an organization scales and the people change, people come, people go, it gets a lot harder at scale to do that when it comes to, you know, the types of tactics that I've talked about. And so there is that kind of lack of scalability there in that at certain stages. And that's where you need to be able to come in and use the functions uh, that, that support that kind of customer level focus, whether it's, you know, internal teams like your enablement team, obviously, or say product marketing teams, or even, you know, customer advocacy, loyalty teams, you know, reference management teams, people who are engaged with, you know, speaking with the install base, you know, making sure that those people, you know, are constantly able to add value to how sales approaches things and influence the playbook really very directly. Um, again, I'm, 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 you know, I'm a true believer at this point. I know that the inst- aside from the employees, the install base is the most valuable asset, you know, your business has. You've got to figure if that's the case, then you've got to figure out how to leverage that for the top of funnel. And then you've got to figure out how to leverage that for the sales playbook, too. So mm-hmm. I think it's a little easier to summarize there for larger businesses because they have access to so many different types of tools mm-hmm. and solutions and roles that they can bring in. And that adds in, you know, kind of a unique layer of support for being customer oriented. If you're able to go to those kind of customer you know, centric roles, in particular customer marketing roles, and take what you know they're learning and put it into the top of the funnel, not just in revenue, but in advice for how to sell. Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. I like it. Well, I'm gonna wrap, Joseph, because this has been, uh, dare I say, a master class of uh, customer-led growth here. Uh, I'm gonna ask the question we ask all of our guests, and I didn't put it on the prep doc, so this is a little bit of a little bit of the hot seat, but it's not too hard. Uh, Joseph, how would you describe sales in one word? Partnership. No hesitation. I like it. You're welcome to elaborate if you wish. Yeah. Um, you know, if you've, if you've had a lot of, like a lot of, a lot of AEs out there will have experience, you know, like I grew up like, you know, selling candy bars at recess, you know, to other kids, that kind of thing. Just, mm-hmm. you know, having that interest in, you know, that, that business piece and, you know, that, that flowers as you grow older. And when you sort of get into the startup world or you've been in the small business world in particular, before you go into larger corporates, and I've spent time, you know, in these, you know, hyper growth startups, you know, whether it's, you know, 
10 million dollars in revenue or 150 160 million dollars in revenue and i'm lucky yeah. to have had you know a couple of them like similar web and walk and go public which has been really great so you know when you're when you're in that type of when you're in that type of situation the you you really do learn that you know it's, it's kind of an old kind of hacky sales thing that we say people don't like to be sold don't like to you know be sold to but they love to buy and they buy from someone they trust I think the better way to say that is people buy from people who really do make an effort to partner with them, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in tech, like people are coming to me and us and they want to buy the solution and they want to buy the partnership we're bringing to them. And when people are buying, you know, solutions, you know, you're putting your, you're putting your neck on the line. You're going out there buying, you're spending, you know, thousands of dollars on a software. You're taking the resource internally, get it deployed. Something that I try to tell every, you know, customer when we're, what, before we, you know, kind of finalize, you know, our kickoff is, you know, I understand that this is an investment. I understand that, you know, you're going out there and, you know, you're putting, you know, your reputation in line with every piece of software you buy. Right. And I understand that. I've been there. I've done it successfully. I've done it unsuccessfully mm -hmm. for myself personally as, you know, a sales leader. And I know what it means to fail doing something like that. Right. And because I understand that well, and because of just who we are as a business, you're going to have my support in creating the, our support in general, but my support specifically, my partnership and making this successful 10 times out of 10 in the business. So for me, you know, that's what it's all about. Just partnering with them to make them successful in their roles. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Joseph, thank you again, truly, truly for your time uh, and for your expertise. I really enjoyed the session. I'm sure our listeners did as well. Uh, so I want to say thank you and uh, we'll leave you to the rest of your of your evening. I appreciate that. Great to meet you, Devin.